to introduce uh, Dr. James Wright from the University of Calgary. And he's going to uh, address us on the topic, McLeod misunderstood, misinterpreted, and maligned. Jim, James Wright. Uh, thank you, John. So these are my learning objectives. We'll go through each of these in detail. Uh, I am going to focus a little more on my disclosure statement because I have McLeod biases that I should declare. So I believe that McLeod was necessary but not sufficient for the discovery of insulin in Toronto. His contributions were to give Banting the opportunity to explore his ideas, to provide Banting sage advice during 1921, to recognize the potential of the work by the end of 1921, to refocus his lab at it in 1922-23, to provide early physiological insights into insulin's action, to look for other insulin sources, and to orchestrate potential business alliances and local international administrative structures to safely and optimally use insulin in North America, Britain, and around the world. And my other disclosure is McLeod has been unfairly treated by history. So first we're going to discuss McLeod's uh, fish insulin research from 1922 to 1924. So where did he get the idea? In 1846, German physician Heinrich Brockmann uh, described spherical structures near the gallbladder as fish pancreas in his doctoral thesis. In the 1890s, French histologist Edouard Leguisse and others showed these spherical structures to be the Piscine homologue of pancreatic islets. In 1903, Scottish zoologist John Rennie uh, described principal islets and, uh, quote, the constant occurrence in a definite location of a particular islet, end quote. So in 1904, Rennie published the descriptions and drawings of principal islets and smaller islets in 25 taxonomically diverse teleost fish species. Two of these, Lophius piscatorus, the monkfish, and Cotus scorpius, the common sculpin, have massive islets measuring up to 1.4 centimeters in diameter. So obviously, uh, these were not species that were available on uh, this side of the Atlantic. So these would be the uh, uh, comparative species here. Uh, so you can see the uh, anglerfish and uh, sculpin. So this next slide shows uh, the uh, sculpin uh, with its uh, principal islets. You can see the spleen and stomach, and then the two red arrows indicate uh, two principal islets. So this is what the sculpin principal islet looks like histologically. So on the left, you can see an H&E stain, uh, basically one big solid islet with a thin capsule of excrement pancreas on the surface, and on the right, an insulin stain. So now we move on to John Rennie and Thomas Fraser's paper, The Islets of Langerhans in Relationship to Diabetes. So Rennie and Fraser made principal islet extracts and treated diabetic patients at the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. Unfortunately, they boiled the extracts. In all but one instance, the extracts were administered orally. And in all but one instance, the patients they selected have what we now know as type 2 insulin resistant adult onset diabetes. So if you're interested, uh, it's alluded to in this uh, paper. So these studies were performed at McLeod's alma mater, and he was well aware of them. Once Banting and Best had preliminary data, McLeod must have immediately recognized that extracting fish islets would be a much simpler approach than pancreatic duct ligation in dogs to produce extracts. But McLeod knew that Banting was motivated to test his duct ligation hypothesis, and that an approach not requiring surgery might not seem attractive to him. So McLeod encouraged Banting and Best to publish their work, which they did in the spring of 1922, and then he embarked on his fish islet work in St. Andrews-by-the-Sea, New Brunswick that summer. <clears throat> 
So this is the marine biological station as it appeared at the time. Uh, here you can see uh, images of uh, Dr. McLeod with the red arrow over his head and uh, uh, A.G. Huntsman, the director of the uh, 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 biological station. So in 1922, in the Journal of Metabolic Research, McLeod published The Source of Insulin, a study of the effects produced on blood sugar by extracts of the pancreas and principal uh, islets of fish. So McLeod made extracts from both principal islets and excrine pancreas and found that only the islet tissue lowered blood glucose levels in rabbits. This publication was considered the ultimate proof that islets were the source of insulin as bantings and collops extracts were made from atrophic or whole pancreata. One gram of principal islet tissue provided greater yield of insulin than one kilogram of bovine pancreas. At the time of this publication, it was unclear whether worldwide demands for fish or for insulin could ever be obtained from livestock uh, pancreata. So here we have a letter from McLeod to Collop in September 1922, and he's quite excited about his work. Uh, my work at St. Andrews uh, was most successful for I obtained unassailable evidence that the zymogenous pancreas in the teleosti contain insulin, uh, whereas it is extremely uh, uh, plentiful in the uh, principal islets. This uh, proves the source uh, beautifully. The pancreas of the skate and uh, dogfish, uh, which would be cartilaginous fish, uh, in which uh, the islets are scattered uh, within the eczymogenous cells, uh, on the other hand, uh, give uh, powerful extracts. So from 1923 to 24, McLeod and two students uh, assessed whether or not commercial production of insulin from teleost fish is reasonable. This is uh, coverage in the Halifax newspaper, and of course, uh, you can see in the lower right corner, uh, the work was credited to Banting. So since there was no commercial fisheries for monkfish or sculpin, the students focused on uh, Atlantic cod pancreas, which also proved to be an exceedingly rich source of insulin. So here you can see the diagram with the arrow showing the cod principal islet sits on top of the gallbladder like a cocked hat. So here you can see the two students, uh, McCormick and Noble, at the biological station in 1923. And the students did uh, work on both inshore and offshore cod fisheries. So on the left, you can see a child harvesting cod principal islets while fishermen gut uh, fish in Grand Manan Island, New Brunswick. Uh, the inshore cod fishery uh, was highly cost effective for producing insulin, but the fishery was too small to be uh, a significant source. So then they went to sea. Uh, and uh, on the steam trawler Venosta. And uh, they determined that offshore fisheries presented many logistical problems. So although it was efficient to, to make insulin, uh, the uh, obtaining them and getting them back to Toronto was problematic. So here you can see the two papers published by the students. It's of note, McLeod's name does not appear on either paper. So by early 1924, it was clear that it was impractical to produce insulin from teleos fish for logistical reasons. Isoelectric focusing had also improved the yield from livestock pancreata, so fish insulin was abandoned, but McLeod returned to St. Andrews and pursued basic science research that summer. And so if you're interested in all of this history, uh, this is a paper published at the time of the 80th anniversary of the discovery. So here you can see McLeod and McCormick in 1924 doing work with sculpins. And uh, these are the papers uh, that were published from that. You'll note that uh, McLeod is only an author on one of the two papers. <clears throat> 
And here you can see the McLeods leaving at the end of the summer and headed back to Toronto. So now we're going to move on to why, McLeod, uh, why did McLeod agree to Banting's big idea, which had been pursued before and did not make good physiological sense. So Banting's initial great idea was to prevent pancreatic trypsin from destroying the pancreas's internal secretion by inducing excrine atrophy by ligating canine pancreatic ducts. The idea was immediately recognized by scientists, but not the lay public, to be wrong. Frangdon Roberts of Oxford, in the December 16, 1922 uh, issue of the British Medical Journal, and I quote, now it is one of the best established facts in physiology that proteolytic enzymes exist in the pancreas in an inactive form, trypsinogen, which is activated normally on contact with another ferment, enterokinase, secreted by the small intestine. So Roberts wrote that the work, quote, originated in a wrongly conceived, wrongly conducted, and wrongly interpreted series of experiments, end quote. But Roberts quickly dropped his attack as soon as British MRC director Henry Hallett Dale weighed in, praising Banting as an untrained scientist and war hero who had succeeded against the odds. Dale immediately scolded Roberts in the BMJ, quote, it's a poor thing to attempt belittlement of a great achievement by scornful exposure of errors at its inception, end quote. Roberts backed down, and the thorny issue of Banting's big idea did not resurface again for over 30 years. So Banting's big idea was wrong, and the understanding of pancreatic digestive physiology in 1921 was such that McLeod must have known it. Reflecting on this apparent error in judgment, Dale was less charitable to McLeod. He once quipped, quote, Insulin could only have been discovered in the lab whose director was slightly stupid, end quote. McLeod clearly did know better as he had co-authored or authored multiple editions of two medical student textbooks of physiology. Uh, one is shown here, and I'll quote, uh, the pancreatic juice contains three important enzymes, lipase acting on fats, amylopsin acting on starch, and trypsinogen acting on proteins. Lipase and amylopsin are secreted in an active condition, but trypsinogen is without any action until becoming cha changed into trypsin. This does not occur until the pancreatic juice had reached the intestine when the activation is brought about by enterokinase. So did McLeod forget what he wrote in his own student physiology textbooks? While it's conceivable that McLeod did not make the connection about trypsinogen that was obvious to Roberts and other physiologists, it actually seems exceedingly unlikely, and there are better explanations addressing the available facts. So it's important to remember that McLeod had a reputation for letting trainees develop and test their own ideas, good or bad, and to learn from it. McLeod may have believed that the internal secretion, if it existed, would be easier to extract and purify if the starting point was more concentrated islet tissue. In other words, a trophic canine pancreas depleted of acinar tissue, but not islets, should have a much higher concentration of internal secretion per gram of tissue extract than would whole adult canine pancreas containing only 1% islet tissue. Viewed from this concept, the experiments as performed were perhaps logical rather than slightly stupid. Furthermore, extracts made from atrophic pancreas devoid of acinar tissue might not be as prone to generate local toxic reactions at the injection site, a problem that had uh, plagued earlier investigators. Theoretically speaking, several acinar-derived pancreatic enzymes including lipase, which he knew to be active, might be responsible for extract toxicity at injection sites. Banting believed that previous investigators had failed to demonstrate the existence of the internal secretion because trypsin was digesting it during the extraction process. Nowhere does Banting say that he believed it was necessary to deplete pancreatic enzymes 
before extraction could succeed. In fact, he was always exceedingly careful to give Banting full credit for this idea. This uh, may be, in part, uh, one of the reasons McLeod declined authorship on Banting and Best's paper, as it began with this false premise, a premise that Roberts and later Joseph H. Pratt so effectively assailed. Perhaps, considering the difficulties that he had had with the highly volatile Banting, McLeod, if he had a nuanced difference in the interpretation of the role of duct ligation, simply never chose to disclose this, as it could only make things worse. Considering the animosity that existed during and shortly after the discovery of insulin, imagine how much worse it might have been if McLeod later opened his mouth to assail Banting's primary intellectual contribution to the discovery. Common sense, common decency, and perhaps uh, considering uh, Banting's uh, propensity sometimes towards violence, a sense of self-preservation surely dictated his silence. Regardless, current insulin historians uniformly recognize that Banting's big idea played no essential role in the discovery other than to start the gears moving in McLeod's laboratory. So midway through Banting's research in McLeod's lab, Banting had a second great idea, making extracts from fetal calf pancreas. McLeod openly praised this idea and fully credited it to Banting. Uh, I've written a paper on it uh, recently, but there's not time to discuss it in detail, but I invite you to read the paper. So sentiment also may have played a part in McLeod's willingness to help Banting test his great idea. Banting was a war hero. McLeod's brother had won a military cross for medical work in the, at the front before dying of tuberculosis in 1919. McLeod's brother died within days of Banting and McLeod's first meeting. So now we move on to uh, why McLeod was not a co-author on Banting and Best's papers. Members of the Nobel Committee in 1950 and others, when second-guessing whether McLeod should have been co-recipient in 1923, have raised the issue that McLeod was not a co-author on Banting and Best's initial paper and have suggested this should uh, preclude him from consideration. So in his letter to Colonel uh, Gooderham uh, in September 1922, McLeod directly addresses this topic, and I quote, I consider myself most unjustly subjected to the present criticism, i.e. stealing Banting's glory, in view of the fact that I declined the offer of Dr. Banting and Mr. Best to add my name to theirs in the first published report of their work. In many, if not most, laboratories, it is the custom for the chief to have his name on papers when the investigation is in a subject related to that in which he is engaged and if he stands responsible for the conclusions and has participated to the extent that I did in the planning of the research. By this step, I made it perfectly evident that I considered the full credit for this investigation to be Banting and Best's. So though wishing to avoid being guilty of presentism, McLeod clearly would have met authorship criteria today, which would be orders of magnitude more rigorous than 100 years ago. So if co-authorship was merited, why did McLeod refuse it? First of all, it should be noted that many trainees working under McLeod's supervision authored papers without McLeod as a co-author. So this was not unique. Perhaps he and Banting differed on the importance and physiological soundness of Banting's big idea on which it was based and that this was his way of distancing himself, not from the paper's conclusions, but from the premise on which it was based. Furthermore, a cloud alludes to the big idea in the aforementioned letter to Colonel Gooderham. Quote, I believe I am perfectly safe in saying there are very few investigators in the field of diabetes at the time of Bant that ba Dr. Banting undertook it who would have thought the experiment with ductide pancreas worth a serious trial, end quote. So it should be noted that this was written several months before Roberts published his critique. 
Jesse Roth, in a paper uh, celebrating the 90th anniversary of uh, the discovery, and I quote here, given that McLeod had prepared a detailed research plan and methods that they followed and provided much other help, he was justified in being a co-author. Why was McLeod's name not on the article? We imagine that he judged the article to be okay for two beginners to publish, but not suitable for a senior professor and lab chief with an international reputation. So likely McLeod recognized some of the same flaws as Roberts, but he already knew better papers were to follow. So after the kerfuffle in early 1922, during which Banting became paranoid and felt sidelined, McLeod suggested that names of authors appear in alphabetical order in subsequent papers on Enslin, resulting in Banting and Best's names appearing first and second. McLeod also took the principled stance that his name would primarily appear on papers about the physiological effects, and Banting and Best apparently felt justified to have their names appear on early physiological papers for which they made little or no contribution. So Banting and Best's first two papers were published in the Journal of Laboratory and Clinical Medicine for which McLeod and his close collaborator from his time at Western uh, Reserve in Cleveland, Roy G. Pierce, were the associate editors responsible for assessing submission related to physiology and biochemistry. As noted by McLeod historian Michael J. Williams, quote, he was a prolific writer of editorials in this journal, contributing 31 separate articles over the next 16 years on a wide range of clinical and physiological matters, end quote. Perhaps this level of influence for this journal, and if he recognized some flaws in the work from those two beginners, he preferred to stay at least marginally arm's length to protect his own reputation with the readership. Rapid publication for Banting and Best's work was McLeod's primary goal. So how do we know this? So this is a letter uh, from Archibald Byron McCollum, professor of biochemistry at McGill, who wants to nominate McLeod for election as a fellow of the Royal Society based on his first fish insulin paper. And uh, so here's McLeod's uh, response and I quote at length, since I have returned to Toronto, I have found things exceedingly disagreeable. Banting has also criticized my placement of papers for publication, stating that his work should appear in English journals. I've decided, or I have defended my policy on the ground that immediate publication was desirable. In view of all this, I believe it would only serve to fan the fires more and they are almost unbearably hot at present, if I were to publish my recent researches in the transactions of the Royal Society, dearly though I should love to do so. If I sent it to the Royal Society, he would immediately say, I told you so. McLeod all along was endeavoring to dis uh, minimize the importance of my work by its publication uh, in ordinary journals, uh, whilst he placed his own in the most conspicuous one he could think of. And if I should be elected to the society after this article appeared, he would say I sailed in under false colors. Under the circumstances, I will publish it in a regular journal. It would have been impossible for McLeod to predict when Banting and Best's paper was submitted in late 1921 that Banting's downward spiraling temperament would cause the problems it did in 1922 and that McLeod's laboratory would usher this work into the beginning of a Nobel Prize in 1923. McLeod has often left his name off of articles written by his trainees, and this had never been a problem for him before. Uh, this tendency on McLeod's part makes Banting's accusations about McLeod seeking undeserved credit for the discovery seem blatantly absurd. So now we move on to Banting uh, alleging that McLeod provided poor research quality uh, or uh, research quality of training to uh, uh, research trainees. So is there evidence to support this? 
So Banting was generally negative about research performed in McLeod's laboratory. In July of 1923, after hearing McLeod speak uh, at a conference in Edinburgh, Banting commented on McLeod's research presentation, and I quote, McLeod showed lantern slides of his work, which was mostly negative results, but voluminous. He has a diarrhea of words and experiments and a constipation of ideas and results. According to Williams, when commenting on Banting's continuous public hostility towards McLeod, and I quote, in public, he rarely referred in his speeches directly to McLeod by name, but the references were clear. When he talked about the lack of support others had given him in the insulin research, he meant McLeod. When he talked about having once worked with a senior professor who had no ideas but took credit for his student work, he meant McLeod. When he talked about laboratory directors who failed to train creative researchers, he meant McLeod. So Banting's approach to research was a big idea followed by a home run. And this was the antithesis of McLeod's methodical incremental approach based upon solid training, sequential experimentation, and knowledge of the literature. According to Bliss, and I quote, Banting tried very hard to duplicate what he thought was the insulin experience vis-a-vis -vis having a great idea, thinking up the ingenious approach that would solve everything. In his many talks on medical research, he always emphasized the ideas, not the training that research brought to their work. So from this perspective, it's perhaps natural for Banting to conclude that McLeod's approach was not creative. McLeod had no aversion to the generation of negative results as these could be instructive. The fact that McLeod had told Banting when they first met that his proposed study might generate negative results and then acknowledged these would be useful greatly irritated Banting who was only interested in success. According to Bliss when they first met, McLeod concluded that Banting quote, had only a superficial textbook knowledge of the work that had been done on the effects of pancreatic extracts and diabetes and very little practical familiarity with the methods by which a, such a problem could be investigated in the laboratory, end quote. So basically, all he had was his big idea and the energy and drive to prove it was right. According to Best, Banting and I quote, had an aversion to a thorough search of the literature before a problem was undertaken. He felt this procedure blunted the imagination, end quote. Banting believed that McLeod was not a good research supervisor and that his students did not become creative researchers. This opinion likely related to Banting's philosophy on how to conduct innovative research. Banting's uh, beliefs could only have been based upon his personal observations from the time he and McLeod were both in Toronto working on insulin as Banting did not interact with McLeod's trainees before or after his time in Toronto. So was Banting correct? So uh, I've made a list of uh, trainees involved uh, in uh, McLeod's insulin carbohydrate metabolism research. The first was uh, Charles Best. Obviously, we don't need to discuss him. Clark Noble, who lost a coin toss with Best, worked on the physiological actions of insulin, published at least 10 papers while in training, but jaded from his negative experiences with Banting and Best, uh, did not continue in science, but rather worked as a general practitioner in Toronto for over three decades. Norman McCormick published at least 10 papers as an MA MD student. Uh, he worked with McLeod on fish insulin and other topics. His long academic career was highly successful as a pioneer of radiation oncology in Canada. Next, uh, Israel Chekhov. Uh, so uh, he completed a PhD with McLeod. He authored or co-authored 12 papers on experimental diabetes or the effects of insulin under McLeod's supervision, many without McLeod as a co-author. He moved to Berkeley where he published over 400 career papers and supervised 74 PhD students. 
He became an expert on cholesterol metabolism, atherosclerosis, fatty liver disease. He was also a pioneer in the use of radioisotopes in medical research. Next is Jacob Markowitz, uh, also a PhD student. He published at least two insulin papers. He became a pioneer in experimental heart transplantation, had a long and successful career as a physiologist and experimental surgeon. In 1986, the Academy of Surgical Research established an annual Jacob Markowitz Award for career achievements in experimental surgery. The list of recipients is a who's who of those who changed the course of modern surgery. Next is Frank Allen. So he did a postdoctoral fellowship for one year uh, under McLeod. He published at least three insulin papers, none list McLeod as a co-author. He did a, a fellowship at the Mayo Clinic, then became the head of their diabetes service relocated to Boston in 1932, organized the medical department of the Leahy Clinic, and then was the clinic's executive director until he retired. He was a senior consultant for the FDA, a recipient of the Joslin Medal. And on the 20th anniversary of McLeod's death, Allen published a brief tribute and spoke glowingly of his experience as a fellow working in McLeod's team. So here I quote, my personal memories of McLeod recall a man who sought to give his assistants a free opportunity to develop their own ideas and to work out their experiments independently, who offered guidance without dominance, who was generous in providing opportunities for participation in scientific meetings. His greatest honor was the esteem of his students, assistants, and colleagues. So it's inconceivable that Banting and Best would not have known all of these contemporary, uh, uh, contemporary trainees personally, and it seems highly unlikely they would have been unaware of their subsequent long successful careers. So if McLeod's lab had a bad reputation, why did he leave such an impressive trail of successful trainees and young collaborators? Clearly, Banting and Best were wrong in their seemingly vexatious accusations. According to Bliss, McLeod, and I quote, authored or co-authored nine monographs and some 200 scientific papers, end quote, but I've been unable to find a complete list of the latter. Uh, tracking his trainees' papers is also not possible without an accurate list of trainees, and to make matters uh, more difficult, McLeod often chose not to include his name as co-author on perhaps more than half of their papers. And I think that's probably an underestimate. So uh, however, uh, the records I can uncover suggest that McLeod's trainees were highly productive when working under his supervision and many became successful academics. So I conclude with a quote from Bliss. McLeod, quote, was a gentle, learned physiologist doing his job with dignity and diligence as he orchestrated one of the great achievements in the history of medicine, end quote. So I further add he should not be misunderstood, misinterpreted, or maligned. So Banting would not have discovered, uh, discovered insulin without McLeod as he lacked the expertise to pursue his big idea on his own. McLeod, who had the requisite expertise, would not have made the discovery on his own as he had mostly moved to acid base research and was not looking for it. So strangely, they needed each other. Thank you. Again, a great talk. So, so let's take some questions. Dr. Jeffrey Friedman. Um, first of all, that was fantastic. <laughs> Thank um, you. I have a question and then uh, two comments. Uh, the question is, could you say more about the origin of the standardization of insulin dosage using uh, rabbits to uh, to define what a unit was. So th that would be Cloud's role in it. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the question is about standardization of insulin units, and so th that probably originally kind of uh, began with Collop, 
Uh, and, uh, you know, they were using this to try to figure out, uh, you know, potency of various different extracts and uh, also then to speculate on how much you might have to give to a diabetic patient. The McLeod was heavily involved uh, with uh, the League of Nations, uh, you know, uh, a decade later probably, uh, with uh, trying to uh, develop a standardized unit that would be kind of uh, worldwide. Uh, there were a number of assays that were bioassays for trying to uh, you know, estimate insulin. There was a mouse convulsion uh, method that had been developed where a large number of mice were given uh, you know, insulin. And you know, so uh, there were initially bioassays uh, and, you know, obviously it was a long time before, uh, you know, uh, it could be standardized by anything other than a bioassay. So the rabbit uh, model persisted for a good while. Um, and the second is sort of a hybrid uh, comment question. So uh, you alluded to something that Jesse Ross, uh, Roth said more explicitly, which is that there were the deficiencies on the uh, first paper that Banning and Best published without McLeod uh, were sufficient that he may not have wanted his name on it. So I thought I would just read to you some an analysis we did once that I think illustrates how flawed uh, that paper was, especially in comparison to the Kleiner paper uh, that preceded it. So they reported in that paper 71 injections of pancreatic extracts into six dogs. In their uh, discussion, they refer to 75 injections into 10 dogs, but the results section only shows the, 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 six, the fewer injections into six dogs. There were only two trials using extracts from other tissues as a control, one from liver, one from spleen. Of the trials with interpretable data, 37 of 63 injections were suggested to have an effect, although in many cases the effect was small. In these studies, 25 different sets of conditions were used, differing with respect to how the extracts were made, acid or base extraction, whether whole pancreas or pancreas after duct ligation was used, and how long the time interval was between the preparation of the extract and the injection. I think uh, our conclusion was that owing to the lack of consistent experimentation, it was almost impossible to interpret the data. And I, I wonder, frankly, I would like to know your thoughts on whether or not that could explain McLeod's reluctance to attach his name to it at that point. Yes, yeah, so the, the question relates to uh, the large number of flaws that can be identified in Banting and Best's first paper and whether that uh, related to the uh, uh, unwillingness of McLeod uh, to uh, put his name as a co-author. and. You know, we don't know for sure, uh, but, you know, I would be almost certain that that is correct, that, uh, you know, it would be uh, kind of embarrassing, you know, when there are that number of errors. Uh, you know, there are huge inconsistencies, as you pointed out, you know, in the paper. And, uh, you know, one of the ones that Frankden Roberts, uh, you know, brought to the attention in his, uh, you know, follow-up paper after the, um, you know, the publication of, uh, you know, Banting and Best, it was that uh, basically looking at their own data, uh, the more potent extract came from non-duct ligated degenerated pancreas that uh, one of uh, the, uh, sets of data that they had provided was, uh, uh, you know, showed basically a higher potency of the whole pancreas extract than the duct ligated extract, yet they claim the opposite in the paper. And so uh, I do think it's highly likely, you know, McLeod, I think, you know, if I had to speculate, I think he wanted you know, he was of the opinion that Banting and Best needed to publish their work before his lab could publish anything else related to that. And they're accumulating good data, 
that they're having to hold on to in order to make sure that Banting and Bess get full credit for their work. And so uh, I, I suspect you know, as you know, a associate editor of the journal that the paper was published in, that uh, he probably likely facilitated a very fast review and a very fast publication so that once that was done, better stuff could be published afterwards. Pat Brubaker is here, and I'll just point out with something you probably already know, but others may not, which is that that separation of the islets from the exocrine pancreas and fish was used by Joel Havner to clone the glucagon gene, which uh, uh, has since uh, led to the development of some really powerful new therapies, including GLP-1 and GLP-2. So that anatomic distinction is, has had, a, had quite a big impact in the field of metabolic disease. Yeah, absolutely. and. The, uh, the Brockman bodies, or the principal islets, the alpha cells in, in those uh, big islets uh, actually can directly produce uh, GLP-1. So uh, you know, there's no uh, you know, kind of post-translational modification or anything going on that the fish islets actually produce both simultaneously. Dr. Patricia Brubaker. A really interesting talk. Um, I wonder if I could just uh, comment that that I was really struck by Banting's rather vitriolic uh, discussion of McLeod's negative data and presenting negative results. And so, if you go back again to the paper that Dr. Friedman was discussing, it is notable that there were two controls in one of their traces that included negative effects of liver and spleen. So given Vanting's later comments, I wonder if we're actually seeing the rather uh, cautious, sound, scientific approach, in fact, of McLeod in those tracings, forcing them, perhaps, to do appropriate scientific controls. So, so I think that is correct. I mean, uh, you'll recall the work was done during the summer of 21, Banting came back, or uh, sorry, McLeod came back from Scotland on September 21st, 1921, and he sat down, you know, with both trainees and uh, kind of went through and critiqued, you know, what they had done and laid out some additional controls that he felt was necessary before they could publish their work. So, yes, I think you're right. Dr. Angel. I enjoy that immensely. Um, we haven't heard about the structure of the department uh, during this period, the number of colleagues, professional colleagues there, and the surprise is that no one came to J.G.R. McLeod's defense, or no comment was made about other response. So this silence implies complicity, uh, and so Banting must have had an enormous impact on others uh, and their attitudes toward McLeod. Yeah, so I, th I think you're right. It's hard for me to know, uh, being based in Calgary, what the structure was of the U of T physiology department at the time. But there clearly were some other uh, junior uh, faculty members, uh, one of which famously suggested the longevity experiment, you know, Marjorie the dog, in order to take a depancreatized dog and see how long you could keep the dog alive and that was a junior faculty member who suggested that particular experiment, which both McLeod and Banting agreed to. So, uh, so it is puzzling. Uh, I think, if I had to speculate, 